Hipster know-it-alls about everything. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with Carsick? We never made the movie. I you should. I'm still, I still, I still, you I can still get it. I kept it. pushing them. Like, what happened? And they, you know, you know how the agents are. They're like, yeah. I don't know. And well, then because somebody so has to option it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it would work as a movie. Of course it would. You know it's what great. I mean? It's <laughs> a great book. It's hilarious. I think we should be good. I apologize. We'll talk about the hitchhiking a little bit. Maybe. All right. All right. Now you want me sitting like this, or? Yeah, I think any way you're comfortable See, in the these couch. Are marijuana prints. Yes, yes. Well, everywhere you look here. I mean, you could spend a year just in this room. Uh, so I'll it's, give you a it's tour. so amazing. Yes. And in fact, when you give us a tour, you'll you maybe do we'll some things. But I don't like everybody. Whoever comes here wants to do the exact same. Of course, thing. of course. And it ends up being about my house, which I try to keep. Right, going, right, right. You know. Well, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. not that obsessed with that. I mean, yeah. I love your house. I'll I, show it to you. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, we don't have to shoot yeah. too much at, at all. This, this is what I want you. Great. So, okay. uh, all right. Let me know when you guys are ready. You so how many we got? Two cameras or one? one. Just one. Just one. Um, and you're very, doing pictures, very, okay. So. Yeah, we'll take a couple of photographs, I guess. Um, all right. Okay, well, first of all, thank you. Sure. Thank you for being you. Well, I'm um, honored to be here. Your movie was the only one I saw when I hitchhiked across the country. I, I know, I appreciate that. That's, <laughs> that's so true. nice. I, I know, thank you, thank you. All right, so I know you like alliteration, and I don't want yeah. to embarrass you, but I wrote down some words that you've meant to me personally. Uh, influence, inspiration, icon, iconoclast, and innovator. Well, so you didn't say idiot. So <laughs> I didn't you. say idiot. I saved that <laughs> that's one. That's Iggy Pop. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, thank you again. Like I said, for being you, for your work, um, for thank your you. sensibility, for your your influence on me personally. I, I can't uh, put that into words. Um, I was curious when you shot the the grand finale of Pink Flamingos. Um, were there onlookers? If somebody was walking by, we, they would have been standing right there. We certainly didn't have a permit. We did not have uh, cops watching or anything. Matter of fact, we walked up and down forever because the dog wouldn't shit. So, right, right. You know, it took hours, and it was the last shot of the movie. Yes. And um, if someone had walked by at that exact moment that Divine finally did it, they would have just been in it, I guess. <laughs> you know, a forced extra. It's very Dogma 93, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Be long before Dogma 93. Yeah. Uh, and that's one other thing about you that we'll get into. I mean, a lot of the um, the, the more modern sort of uh, movies uh, that sort of touch on some of the subjects and themes that you've dealt with, you were doing it a decade before they even were making their movies. And we'll t even something like Salo yeah. is not made till 1977. Salo is a great movie. Salo is a great movie. I have presented it at festivals a lot. Yes, it's I, one of my favorite movies also. I prayed it passively. <laughs> that's a Pasolini drawing. Yeah, so you right have there. a Pasolini book over but here. But that's as a well. painting I just got. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. <laughs> of a shepherd. He what do you think shepherd. about his he murder? He likes pimples the best. What did you think about his murder? It was unfortunate, you know. That's what I, you know. It was unfortunate. <laughs> yes, let's put yes. it that way. Yeah. Uh, he did have a dark streak, obviously, and yes. the guy was ugly. That's the only thing. I'm gonna have to die for a hustler. At least he could have been cute. <laughs> um, but he liked pimples. I did a whole art piece called pa Twenty One Pasolini Pimples, where I went through all the movies and identified the men that Pasolini liked and then cut out their pimples and glued them on a canvas. <laughs> that's, that's, that's obscure. That's, yes, that's, that's that is very, that's esoteric. Deep into a movie. <laughs> he was a pimple queen. Yes, that's very interesting. And a communist that. and a homosexual and yes, a Catholic. Yes, yes, and a poet. <laughs> and a poet. <laughs> yeah, and a poet as well. But he was against hippies because he liked the cops because they were more working class. They were tough, like, like Mishima. Yes. Mishima well, was Mishima sort of into was that even militaristic. More right wing, right? He was Jim yeah. Jones. He had his own the... army. Yeah, he did. He which had I'm his own... always jealous of. Yes, that is that is something <laughs> to aspire to. Yeah. Your own army. Yeah. And then he committed seppuku, yeah. which is kind of cool also. You know, that takes a lot of courage to me just to stick that thing in your stomach and pull it across. Yeah, it's like it's cool ways easier. But Jim Jones shot himself. That's right, that's right. After he killed 900 people. I guess Mishima, though, didn't really kill his army. But they committed suicide. They well, committed mass suicide. You know, that is, and I am friends with people that are People's Temple survivors. And they have a whole program today. They have newsletters, they have everything. And they get to, their main thing is that it was murder. Yes, yes. The ones that lived. Because without the guards there, they wouldn't have done it. Right. I think they're half right. Right, right. That's interesting. Um, so when you were making the, like, Pink Flamingos, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Were you, and you were out on the street and you know, you're various places, and you obviously pre-permit world of independent filmmaking, underground filmmaking yeah. really. 
Um, were you concerned about your personal safety? Were you concerned about getting busted? Or did you well, think about things like that? Yes, because we had been busted for making Mondo Trash shows. So right. on the streets, and it was a national news story. We went to ACLU, handled it the whole bit. So we were nervous about that. That's why I built that trailer deep in the woods on a friend of mine's property that had a commune. Right. That nobody knew it was about there until the hunters discovered it. And they would go by and shoot at it. So we eventually had the person that was the watchman made more money than anybody in the movie because he had to be there every night. Right. But um, it, when we burned it down, we never asked permission. We had no fire. And my brother was one fire extinguisher. It was in the middle of winter in an entire woods. The entire neighborhood could have burned down in a minute. Yes. So, no, we just did it. Yeah, you just That's did it. That's what we just did. Mink yeah. once just said, we just did it. It wasn't like something that was planned or it was a group effort. It yeah. was like almost like a, a terrorist attack on the tyranny of good taste. Now yes. that's in hindsight. I yes, yes. And I go there where the trailer is and you can still see the grass didn't grow back, but it's McMansions now. Oh, that's so weird. And I almost not, I knocked on the people's door to tell them, but they weren't home. Oh, and that's so funny. I wonder what the them. response would be. That would be great. It's worth well, filming I hope that. it's like coming up like from the ground, some filth, Like a poltergeist, yeah, poltergeist like kind of thing. Indian burial ground. Yes, yes, that, that know, would be very cool. That's possible. The McMansion, because there's no kind of houses I hate more than a McMansion. Yes, and there, and there are, I guess, popping up everywhere. Um, so, were you ever? Um, uh, were, so, you were arrested, obviously, uh, during Mondo uh, well, trial show. Arrested for conspiracy to in, commit indecent exposure, but I had been, and I'll tell you that story. But I had been arrested. Well, the censor board always stopped me, you know, and I had and multiple. Pink Flamingos was seized for obscenity many times, and mm. we eventually just pled guilty because it cost $5,000 the fine, and the lawyer cost more, and the Museum of Modern Art bought a print, and I thought, well, this will get us off. The juries did not care. And I've always said, it's true. At midnight, it's a joyous experience. At 9 a.m. when you have jury duty and you're watching Pink Flamingos, it is obscene. <laughs> <laughs> so it was much That's easier to plead guilty. The context yeah. of time. Context. No, the context of place, too. Yes, And yes. The, who you're watching it with. You know, if you've just gotten jury duty, you're uptight anyway. And what are you going to be sitting there with a bunch of strangers going, ha, 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 you know, a copper <laughs> phasia. Um, did any, what, you know, do you remember, like, uh, in... Um, I don't know if you ever saw Bananas, the Woody yeah. Allen movie, but the, the, he he pans, he keeps panning across the jury when he's on trial, yeah. and there's always the one guy who's like laughing at the inappropriate joke, or he's sipping out of a fish tank at one yeah. point, and I wonder if there was the one guy on the jury who actually was secretly enjoying that movie. Well, they didn't say if they, they didn't were, say because it, I, yeah. I never was found innocent. I yes. never had a hung jury either. No, no, and speaking of hung juries, tell us about the indecent exposure bus. That was, we're making Mondo trash of the scene, Divine is in a gold, no, in a red Cadillac Eldorado convertible with the top down, in full gold lame Toreador outfit, driving and she hallucinates a male hitchhiker whose clothes disappear. Well, we just went to Hopkins campus. We didn't ask, we filmed it. And some, at Sunday morning, and some guard saw us and called the police. We all escaped. We all got busted, but Divine got away with a nude man in the car and a Cadillac with the <laughs> top turned down in full drag, which I've always said did not say a lot for the police. Incredible. But we went to jail and I, called the ACLU. I don't know what I was, so grandiose thinking, you know, this was the time of major civil rights movement and stuff, you know. And it happened to be the one day a month they met to meet and they answered the phone. And she said, we'll get you out. And later in life, I was at a friend of mine's trial for murder. And the judge, his assistant came over to me and said, uh, the judge would like to see you. And I thought, oh my God, she's going to give me grief. And then she said, you remember me? You should. I got you out of jail. And it was the woman who got me out wow. of jail for the ACLU. So a nice nostalgic reunion. It was. And then I became friends with her again. Very, very good friends. Oh, and cool. she used to come to my Christmas party with the murderer who I did help get out of jail, who did great, is still doing great. Oh, but cool. they'd be at the same buffet table, which was a little awkward. <laughs> very juxtaposition. Yeah. Um, so we got off. The okay. ACLU gave us a great defense. It became a national news story. It was on the cover of Variety. It was all of, it became a joke. And the judge read us a poem, go behind the door and sin no more. And I had to go down and show the vice squad. They thought I was a pornographer, right? They didn't know about underground movies. They never heard of it. Right. And I said, well, I'll show you one of my other ones. And I showed them Hag and a black leather jacket, which is eight millimeter, already not, no nudity, anything. And they just sat there, you know, <laughs> so they knew to let us off. Yeah, yeah. Do you think you think things would be different if you were doing it today, that kind of stuff? Do you think that? Well, you we would... don't have a censor board anymore, but uh, would it be different? Yes, today it would be different. Although, even before hairspray, where I was safe to like, 
when Pink Flamingos was out, Governor Mayor Schaefer, who was fairly eccentric and was in power here for a long, long time, and eventually was the governor, said, I don't care what they are, just keep making them here. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so that's they great. Were supported. Yeah. 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 Well, you did put Baltimore on the map. No, I, Baltimore was on the map. Well, I mean, Baltimore Fort was McHenry on the map. Henry and. Well, right. Baltimore was on Madeline the map. Madeline Murray. Right, right. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. Although I think you, your, your fame has transcended hers, actually, at this well, point. Well, I tried to. I wrote about her in my last book. Yeah. I'm still obsessed by Madeline Murray. When we went to Catholic high school here, they told us to break her windows. Really? Yeah. Wow. They said, we wouldn't say anything if you did. That's how they said it. <laughs> that's so great. Um, well, you said your most subversive work is hairspray. I explain that. Well, because it's snuck in on mid-America. It's playing in every high school in the world, practically. Yeah. And uh, drag queens get the part, and the fat girls the power. And, you know, and two men are singing a love song to each other. It encourages your white daughter to date black guys. And no one seems to notice. And can you explain that? Do you have no, to analyze that? No, I can't explain yeah. it. Because a fat girl stands for every outsider there is. And now everybody wants to be an insider. When I was young, nobody wanted to be one. But um, I think it just sneaks by. They yeah. don't ever get it. The Bush family, the older Bush, and Barbara came to see the movie. He was twisting out front, <laughs> which I thought, oh my God. Well, these <laughs> days, that sounds great. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> right, right, of but, course. Uh, it is a Trojan horse. It snuck in middle America and stayed there yes. with, a, with a force that yes. still is there. Absolutely. And, it's and, a, a standard, it's a, it's a classic, yeah. you know. And like, now... Because of political correctness, the, the public schools cannot cast by race, weight, or anything. So I've seen it with a skinny black girl playing Tracy, wow. where it makes no sense, but the kids don't notice, which is even better. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's bizarre. So you're not like works. Beckett, where you're okay with people reinterpreting your work. No, to a point, we've stopped. I think Edna should always be a man, because even though there's no reason for that, it's like Peter Wise, Peter Pan, a, yeah. a man, basically. Yeah. Um, a woman, always. Right. Um, Maybe it's because the fact that Edna is a man is a secret that the audience shares with the actors, but the characters, Tracy doesn't think her mother's transgender. Right, of course, of course. So it's a secret that the audience and the actors have from the characters. That's very interesting. And that's why it works. I that's think. a dynamic that you don't yeah. normally see where the actor and the audience is are in are, on it. In on it, and another actor may not be. No, the characters yes. themselves are Yes, the are characters, not in on yes, it. yes. Yeah. So that, that's fascinating, like actually. Like Edna doesn't think she's a man. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, like, like, um, and how did you feel about the movie version of it? I liked it. Yeah. I thought, you know, first of all, each time, it's amazing to me. You know, uh, the, the the NBC movie, I had a few things I didn't like that they made Motor Mouse skinny, right? And right, they made the right. gym teacher straight, and Rosie O'Donnell played her. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was such Another genius layer. when Rosie said she would play the part. Yeah. Rosie's out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but uh, yeah, it was fine. You know, each time. They reinvent it in a different way, yeah. but you have to reinvent it differently. Right. And when it'll stop is when it isn't. And I've always said the only thing I make a joke about it, but that I used to make a joke on Letterman. I said hairspray on ice, and the next day they called me up and said, "Yes, we're interested in doing that." <laughs> and then I said hairspray in space. My friend said, "But <laughs> hair pie, the porn version." Uh -huh. I'll stop it. And there hasn't been a porn version. Right, right, right. Well, it's only a matter of time, it seems. Well, I think it should have happened by now. Hair pie is such a perfect. Hair pie, you ha it's yeah. there for you. It's it was the only thing the New York Times wouldn't print when I did that joke when I wrote the article. Really? About doing hairspray. But I argued with them; they would not print it. However, <laughs> and the New York Times has never reviewed Pink Flamingos. All the news is fit to print, but they just ran a huge article on the cover of the style section about the John Waters camp recently and yes, wrote I saw, about I a man drawing my portrait with his penis. Right. So times have changed. Maybe they should go now and review it for the first time, and that would they be a very even, interesting thing. They didn't even review it when it came out for the 25th anniversary, Was, and the Times has been very good to me oh, pretty yeah, much always. Yeah. So, so I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying it's... Do they still even have that thing, all the news that's fit to print? I think, I mean, it's, I think it still says it in the corner, they, if you buy the paper version. Which I do. Yeah. Um, they finally printed the word pussy from Pussy Riot. I have to give them credit. Right. Because it became so political, they could not yeah. uh, print it. Yeah. And I think they printed fuck recently, too. Finally. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I think the world has certainly changed. Yeah. Yeah. Once, yeah. The, once the Trump came into power, yeah. everything has changed. Um, I don't know. Did they print grabbing pussy or just pussy riot? It depends. That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. I should have to check. Um, who was the film critic at the time of Pink Flamingos came out? Well, oh, no, was Vincent Camby, and he was well, great. Canby. He reviewed it in a Sunday Think piece. Right. But it never got right. a regular review. Yeah, yeah. 
And I remember seeing it at the, uh, I think it was at the Waverly. That was, which, Hairspray? No, no, I'm talking about now, I'm going back Elgin. to Pink Flamingos. Elgin, the Elgin, that's where it was, yeah. on 12th Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, yeah. that was the Cinema Village, that was later. The okay, Elgin's yeah. on 8th Avenue, it's Eighth now the Avenue. Joyce Dance Theater. Yeah, yeah. It played there for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, that's where I saw it then. And those were three places that I went to a yeah, lot, yeah. obviously, yeah, everything was playing there. Yeah. Um, I still go to the Waverly, now it's the IFC. Yeah, right, right. Um, Tell me about your original interest in Charles Manson and murderers in general and how that... Well, I have to be really serious if I talk about that. I usually don't because I wrote about Leslie Van Houten in my book, Role Models. Yes, and yes. And it was serious. And I apologized yes. for the early... That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I had about, about your it. About how your attitude it has evolved. Change. Yeah. Because yeah. I later taught in prison. You know, at, when the Manson thing came out, it was at the height of my lunacy. It was in 1969. I made Multiple Maniacs, the yeah. film where we said we did it before they caught Manson. Right, right, right. And right. then they caught Manson in the middle of the movie, so I had to put in the thing where they saw the headline. <laughs> Which, what was I thinking? My father always used to say, that. what are you thinking about? <laughs> and he has a valid, that's a valid question. Yes. But, uh, so then it was ultimate punk rock, blah, blah, blah. but then yeah. I realized there were some real victims, you know, there were real yes. people I taught in prison. I, I went to the trial, I went to all the trials, I was obsessed by that case, and I got to be very good friends with Leslie, and I still wrote a very impassioned, I think, serious plea for her release, and not that it helped, but she has gotten parole dates yes. twice now, and Governor Brown has turned down the first one, and we're hoping he does not turn down. Right, we're waiting one. to find out now, right? She has so, been granted parole. But it hasn't been released. She'd been granted parole for the second time. She got it granted parole last year, and he turned her down. Uh -huh. And this year, he could turn it down again or not. Right, right. He could, and we're waiting to hear that. Right. Um, so it has changed very seriously. And I do still visit prisoners. Some lawyers call me now to go in and visit prisoners that have long sentences. And I do. Yeah. And I taught in prison. But when I wrote that in Shock Value and all, it was way before any of that. Yes. Right? Yes. So it has changed. You know, yeah. in the beginning... I still think trials are great theater. Yeah. You know, the only person I'm jealous of is Judith Clark, the lawyer <laughs> who's never talked to the press, and she did the Unabomber, uh, Kathy, what's her name? She's done yeah. all the yeah. ones. That, and she wins if she gets your life, not death. Yes. And uh, I think we need lawyers. Like yeah. That, yeah. You know, and, yeah. Uh, and so I'm obsessed by her. That's my idea of a celebrity I want to meet. Right. right. <laughs> and, uh, just her and Eminem are the only yeah. ones left. Okay, really. yeah, and neither true. have any desire to meet me. Yeah, you have an Eight Mile soundtrack right over yeah. there, actually. Yeah. So no, do, do neither you know, of them wants to meet me. Do you, just, just to digress, do you know where everything is? Like if I said I noticed a, uh, a book on Lee Friedlander, yeah. would you have a sense of where that was at this point? Yes, but I have three homes, and so sometimes they get moved around a little bit less than I used to, but right. they're all on a computer. Every single thing, what book it is, what edition, if it's autograph, everything. Wow. Right back, paper, right? Yeah. Wow. So, sort of. Have you embraced okay. technology in all ways? I mean, uh, like, do you write on a computer? I still write on legal Longhand, pads. Longhand, yeah. But as soon Me as too, I get the way. first draft, my assistant Trish types it up and puts it in, and then I cut it up more, and it's half written, half. Uh, what would we do without assistance, really? Yeah, well, you need no, somebody before to type I never had one, and I used to pay a typist. Right, right, to come exactly. over and I give exactly. it to her, and, you and then you go to a printing place. Yeah, yeah. We used to go to printing places to make the scripts. In Multiple Maniacs, I had the blue cape that smelled. What was that stuff the mimeo, called? The mimeograph yes, paper. Yes, mimeograph. Right, so, right, you know, right. it's, uh, it doesn't matter how you do it as long as yeah. you write it. It yeah. doesn't matter how you write yeah. or when. To me, yeah. it's just you have to do it. And I'm better. I need my big pens, my clear scotch tape, and my evidence writing pads that got cheap this year. And I called up and complained, and they sent me the new ones free. So many of them <laughs> that are the best quality paper ever. Wow, so they improved the paper. Yes. Well, they had a version I didn't know that's way more expensive, but the regular ones I always got, they made cheaper, and I, I complained. See. I see. Wow, wow. I think they were amazing. It's true, though. <laughs> the quality of the paper, the texture of the well, paper makes a big difference. It rolls up the, otherwise. How the pen it also up. Yeah. relates to the paper yeah. as well. Um, I'm jumping around a little yeah. bit, but I, I have... Uh, tell me about... Uh, uh, let's talk about childhood a little bit. Tell me about these Punch and Judy shows you used to do. Well, I gave puppet shows... I think I went to see the movie Lily that my mother took me to see, and I was on Howdy Doody. When I was really young, my parent, my uncle, lived in New York, and he got me on the peanut gallery. And I went in there, and I thought... It's all a lie, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I was not disillusioned. So you saw that it was a pup. You it saw was the whole little, tiny little stage in this huge studio with like five Hattie Duty puppets, and the whole image was completely blown. But rather than disillusion me, I thought this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And so 
I, I liked puppets and everything, and you know, all I don't know, all film directors, puppeteers, and all <laughs> actors later say to you, "We're not your puppets." Yes, they are. And of course, but, Trump, Trump now is kind of okay. popularized. No puppet, you're the puppets. Oh, well, I didn't hear that one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I had there were hand puppets, and I didn't make any of them. There was no craft involved of puppetry, <laughs> and, and uh, I you bought, bought all the puppets. Store, yeah. I had good ones, but I bought them, or my parents bought them for me. And then I would go through my parents' phone book and send out ads saying, book it today, blah, blah, blah. Like, because I got variety really early, too. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then I had maybe one or two shows a week for 25 bucks at the height of my career, which is in 1956 was a lot. Wow. And so I had a career wow. doing that. But then I got too embarrassed because I thought it was uncool. You know, I was about 14. I thought, I don't know, I can't be a puppeteer. So you, gave, you gave it up. Three years later, I was on acid. Right, 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 right. So <laughs> you know, short, the short. Quick, to, quick, <laughs> that was quick. Uh, that was quick. Yeah. Uh, well, tell me about school. Tell me uh, first of all. Yeah. Tell me about school. About uh, were you uh, were you you know exhibiting aberrant behavior yeah, already probably. in high school and junior oh, high school? Oh, I think my I have this in my spoken word show. But my mother used to tell me when I was kindergarten, I'd come home and say, "There's this weird kid in my class," and he only draws with black crayons and doesn't talk to other people. And I talked about him so much, she asked the teacher, and she said, well, that's your son. <laughs> so I was creating a character for yeah, myself. Yeah, you had an I alter went, ego right, right off the bat. And I was obsessed by rock and roll. I had a top 10 board over my room that I called the record stores, and they knew it wasn't a real, but they went along with it. And I'd average them out, and they number nine, number eight, <laughs> dance around the room. I had a little stage my parents built me, which I'm thinking, that's insane. That's like Divine and Female told us, oh, a little stage. That's where that comes from. <laughs> okay. I had a stage where I would put on endless self-indulgent shows for my poor aunt that would sit there and right, watch them. Right, right. And then I had horror shows in the garage. I, so I always was in show business, yeah, always. Yeah, very prolific at and a very I, early age as well. I went to a good private grade school that if I had quit school in sixth grade, I would know the same thing I got from school today is that. I hated the rest of school. They discouraged every interest I ever had. And I have never in my life had a job where someone asked me if I went to school. Right, there you go. Ever have right. I gotten a paycheck, ever from anywhere where they said to me, did you go to college? Yeah, yeah. If you know what you want to do, you don't have to go to school. Yeah, that's... But if you don't, I'm glad I didn't want to be a surgeon. You have to go to school. That's, that's, that's one area. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? That's something you and I also have in common is we both quit NYU Film School. I didn't quit. I got thrown out. You got thrown I only out. Went That's there right. two months. I went to one class. They showed Odessa step sequence. I thought I've seen this, <laughs> and I never went back and stole books from the bookshop every day and resold them to get money and took LSD and got pot in my dorm. They should have thrown me out. Right, I'm not saying right. they were wrong to. Did you head back to Baltimore after that? Well, they told my parents I needed extensive psychiatric treatment. Yeah, and then I came back and made Roman Candles a movie and then got an apartment and then whatever it went on. Talk about um, this, this, because this I think may have been my first uh, awareness of you. Even and even though I ne didn't see that movie at that time, because I think well, I Roman Kemp was never school. played in New York. Yeah, well, I'm I was going to ask you about the Diane Linkletter story. That played maybe once after Pink Flamingos became a hit, when they would show Multiple Maniacs. What, that was the, New York was the last place my film showed. They played right. in San Francisco. They played in Promise Town. They played in L.A. New York came last. Because they were very chauvinist about it. they only the underground scene was New York only. Yes. They didn't want to talk to people from somewhere Interesting. else. Interesting. And um, and you know, I didn't even know it. I was making Mondo Trash at the same time Andy was shooting trash. But yeah. we never knew those titles. And then when they both came out, we were both like, oh, it was so weird, you know. Yeah. I was probably more uptight because Andy was famous. And um, <laughs> so uh, so you know, but still, that movie was just a test. When we were making Multiple yeah. Maniacs, it was the first day I got a sound camera to test it. And we never had improvisation. You can tell nobody's that great at improvising <laughs> it either. I think they'll be the first to admit. Right. And, uh, and it was a sound test. And Diane Linkletter had just jumped, really. Yeah. And, um, and my friend lives in her apartment today. After he bought it, he found you? out it is her apartment. They've even changed the windows. And it wasn't, cause I feel bad for Diane Linkletter. Sure. And it came out way later right. that... She didn't take acid for a year before that. And right. like Leary and Nixon conspired. Right. I mean, uh, uh, Art Linkletter and Nixon conspired to blame Leary and LSD for this, yeah. this death. Which she was makes, probably suicidal by, because well, she was she Art Linkletter's daughter. I don't know. I felt daughter. bad for her. We liked Diane Linkletter. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. She should have come with us. So explain, just give us a little context of that. Tell us who Diane Linkletter was and who well, Art she, Linkletter I did, was. She was, Art Linkletter was a Republican host of a show called P. 
he, kids say the darndest things where he tricked children into talking about going to the bathroom and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a folksy, loved TV host, yes, really loved. Love Art Linkletter's house party. Yeah. He was a friend of Nixon. He later made AIDS jokes. Um, yeah. So I never liked him. You know, he got on my nerves. But uh, he was a little too all-American for me. Yeah. So it is terrible. She jumped out of the window, and we just had to test something. So I just thought it up that day. Let's yeah. shoot it. And I think we screened it before it was a funeral. I mean, it was really exploited. But it, to 10 people. Right, you know, right, I mean, right. it showed in Baltimore probably at the Baltimore Underground Film Festival. Or something. You know what I mean? It was yeah, hardly, yeah, it didn't yeah. have national distribution or anything. Well, you talk about exploitation. That's another area. I mean, you have so many different influences on your sensibility. Uh, uh, and exploitation filmmakers were amongst them, like the William Castles of the world. Well, I don't think him of exploitation. I think William Castle was almost Hollywood. You okay. Know? okay. I think exploitation, Herschel Gordon Lewis, okay. and Les Meyer, and Doris Wishman, and yes. nudist camp movies, and all that. And we saw all of them. Yeah and drive-in movies, and Ingmar Bergman movies, which I used to see on Acid with Divine. Right, and which Divine were pretty hated intense. Them. No one saw Bergman on Acid. <laughs> Who said, let's drop a hit of Acid and go see Hour of the Wolf? Right. You know? <laughs> but we did. And Divine yeah, said, please, yeah. can't we see Elizabeth Taylor? But, <laughs> and uh, so that, they were big influences to me. Er, Bergman, when he was first shown in Baltimore, they showed him as, nudist came, as nude movies because they really? were... Erica, Eve's Hot Summer. They would yeah. change the titles and just Some, leave in the tits. Monica, the Summer of Monica. Yeah, we call Monica's kind of, yeah. Sins or something. Yeah, and they yeah. would cut out all the dialogue and just leave the tits in. Right, they were, right. He did have nudity and puke first. He, he did. Bergman always had puke. Yeah. Interesting. Before anybody. I wonder how he made his puke, uh, what he used I for I don't puke. know. He, he used puke a lot. He yeah. might have actually had people puking, actually. No, He's, I don't think he did. Uh -huh. I would have You would have tried to do yeah. that. In Female Trouble, there's a scene where Dine as a man pukes. And the nurse was on the set and gave him Epicac, and he couldn't do it. He was like puke shy. This was after Pink Flamingos. What was I thinking again? And the whole crew's going, oh, like everybody's getting Everybody like, else is. Sticking and trying to do it, and he couldn't. He was puke shy. Oh, my goodness. So you had to fake it eventually? Yeah. Okay. Um, cream corn. Cream corn always works. Easy, easy one. The little um, water. The little ketchup. <laughs> When you were when you were starting out, did you have a secret agenda? Was how subversive <laughs> did you want? To me, I was thinking you were like a filmmaking Charles Manson in a way. You were looking to tear well, down I the hope society. I didn't treat the people like that. They still get a percentage. Most That's of the good. No, I don't mean it. the way you treated yeah. your your coworkers, yeah. but I mean in terms of like your your view of society You're through right, the filmmaking. You're right. In a weird way, we were trying to scare the world, and I say that in my book. But we were trying to do it with fiction. We weren't like that. Yeah. 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 You know, when I made Multiple Maniacs, I lived with my parents. It's on my <laughs> parents front lawn divine lived with his parents and was a hairdresser yeah. you know so it wasn't like we really lived like that yeah but that is what we thought was funny right right you know? right so we were it was at the height of the hippie years and we were making fun of it but we were hippie. you know i mean we were in that world yeah. and that's who came to see us and liked us and they all became punks yeah but they just didn't have punk yet right so right. um we were all making being same way i make gaily incorrect jokes when I do my show or like you know even though I secretly think I am politically correct and always have been right maybe right. not a multiple me <laughs> but you do know how to tap into that politically incorrect side of yourself even though I think most politically correct things are I agree with yeah 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 that's an interesting dichotomy technically they're right yeah but yeah, I'm for free speech so I think that anybody should be allowed to talk and I went to a uh a, um, when I was young, to see Agnew speak, and we stopped him, drowned him out in secret. And I even then felt a little bad. I mean, I hated him, but it wasn't I'm fighting for my free to speak. Yeah, right. that's the thing. I mean, and also, you, I, I, I suspect you have a certain degree of decorum and politeness because of your parents. Your parents seem well, like very nice, straight. They you know, taught me people. the tyranny of good taste, and they yeah. were very supportive. And my uncle was undersecretary of the tyranny for Nixon, and I was there throwing horse shit at the right. But we became <laughs> friends, you know. He yeah, was great yeah. later in life, yeah. and I, I liked him. So I, mean, I was always fascinated. Kind of, tell me about Rosemary Woods, you know, and I'll tell you about, you know, some movie star. So, um, <laughs> but he never would. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. Well, he would joke, but you know. Yeah, yeah. And at my mom's funeral, I have a friend named John Dean who was there, and I said, "Oh, this is John Dean." He went, "What?" Like, you know, I, had her, I forgot. You know, the person that betrayed them. Yes, all, yes. Right? Who's actually on TV all the time? I know these he is. Days. He's a yeah, commentator. He's, all he's time, doing yeah. great now. Um, he right. switched sides. 
He did switch sides. Right, right then, I think, yeah, yeah, when he was he testifying, yeah, I think yeah. he realized let's hope that. that happens now. Um, you were ta- uh, uh, let, let's talk about this idea of, uh, y- although you uh, are basically politically correct in the way you... Well, that's my opinion. Yes, yeah. in your opinion, you're politically correct. Um, but you also knew what uh, uh, subversive humor would be. You knew what thrilled you in terms of the subversive humor, in terms of inappropriate humor. Uh, I've been thinking about the alt-right a lot, and I was thinking how um, you were practicing a sort of anti-humor or anti-comedy in a sense uh, before its time. I mean, you know, because th- a lot of people would not realize it was supposed to be funny. Oh, no, the people that came to see me thought it was funny. Yes, but, yeah. th- but there was a whole world of people who didn't think... Some people which... got mad. Now nobody gets mad and I yeah, say worse stuff. Yeah. But the all right, I mean, when I did Bill Maher's show a lot, and I always used to hang around, well, with Breitbart, I liked him. Yeah. And we would hang out, and other people would go, oh, my God, how can you talk to him? And he said to me, I'm just like you. I'm just on the other side. Yeah. He said, I got everything from Abby Hoffman, too. Yeah, right. That's, that's what know, I was going to talk and, about. And I think, I don't think the new ones are like that, Manning. I don't think he is funny ever. Right. I think Breitbart kind of was funny yeah, sometimes, yeah. even though I'm radically against what he did. But... You know, and that's why I think Milo, I don't think he's any great gay Abby Hoffman. I think right, right. Boys in the Band, and even that's getting remade by Ryan. So right, that's right, good. that's right. So, uh, but let them talk, let them hang themselves. Yeah, basically. yeah. You know? Uh, but, I, but also I think that the alt-right uh, is using a lot of the techniques of the left, of Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, well, and you both even. both sides are. It's yeah. like spy versus spy. <laughs> At the inauguration when they had Disrupt 20, I love their names, you know. I have nostalgia for riots. You know, yes, I wish, right. you know, and I read the new book on Antifa, but it's not funny. Right. It was no revolution for right. the hell of it. That's right. what I was hoping. Oh, right. come on. Tell us some new scams on phone credit cards or something, you know. And so it wasn't funny. But you have to. I'm for terrorism of humor. completely. Yes. I am so for that. And right now is the perfect time for it. But they're, but they're so serious. You know, I always said that Trump said one funny thing when he called her Pocahontas. That kind of was funny. Right, right, but right. Elizabeth Warren has never said a funny thing. No, and no. I like her. I'm forward. I the believe Democrats what she says, but funny. don't run her. Right, you know, she right. will lose so much. Yeah. So the thing is, you know, it's easy to target the thin-skinned are the perfect thing, you know? Yeah. And like when Abby Hoffman, when they were all going to go into Trisha Nisk's wedding and spike acid in the thing, yeah. well, this group is going to throw acid at the... I thought they meant LSD, but they meant real Actually, acid. Actually, acid, yeah. I guess I'm getting old. That seems a little extreme. <laughs> Until I heard Disrupt. Until I heard Pelican 212, the group that performed at the uh, inauguration. Yeah. And maybe acid is ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Um, but what do you think about like, uh, like to me that that humor has now gone to a place that really is is its purpose is to offend the left. For instance, the wo- yeah. the poor woman who was killed in Charlottesville, Heather Heyer. You know, there was all these kind of right wing websites had you know headlines about that she was a whore and she was yeah. a slut. The thing is, she it's not a, funny. Yeah. So that's the thing. But in a way, to I th- anybody, th- th- it's really. angering, and I yeah. think, in a sense, that's the goal: is to anger. No, it is. Yeah. And that's why, if I was a Trump supporter, I would probably be happy because he's doing exactly what he said, and we get pissed off. Yeah. They want that. Yes. Yes. You know? So uh, that's the thing. But I don't think it's funny. Yeah. I think it has to be witty. That's why I don't think Milo has said he said he's Ivana Wall, his drag name. Come on, we got Eureka Franklin. <laughs> Sharon Needle, I don't want to hear Ivana Wall. Yeah, yeah. You can do better than that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's what I mean. If you're going to be right wing, come up with something funny. Yeah. Well, you that's the thing. You had this... Uh, uh, Even if we hate it. But yeah. at least, like, whoa. Yeah. If you, you have to kind of give it give it up. When it's yeah. funny, yeah. it's obvious. Um, but that's it seems like they're into the shock and not into the humor as much. Yeah. Well, it's easy to shock. Same way... Yeah. I don't make movies now that are, you know, Hollywood makes hundred million dollar gross out movies now that aren't funny. Right, right, right. That's why I did an art piece called Kitty Flamingos where I rewrote it as a children's movie. <laughs> you just sometimes have to go backwards. Yes, yes. Because it went as far as it could. Yes. Now those movies aren't usually that funny. Yeah, These big yeah. gross out comedies. Right, you know, that, no, no, I or, agree. And most always, <coughs> when a, <clears throat> excuse me, Sure. Most always when a movie is reviewed and said it's John Waters esque, I usually hate that movie. Yeah. yeah. I don't say that in public. Right. But I never right. dish, you know, people's movies. That's not my job. I praise ones that other people hate. Right, right. But right. um 
you know, I always generally don't like it, yes. the ones that they say are like my movies. Yeah, yeah. No, they don't really, I think when they say that, they're not really understanding what you're about. Well, maybe they are, but or, I, I or just some don't agree. Level, they're maybe. just trying too hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true, too. And you, It never feels that way with your stuff. Well, that's why we called Pink Flamingo such a modest name. Yeah. And said yeah. an exercise in bad taste. That was kind of like downplaying. Yeah, and, that's you know, true. That's true. really hideous. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when we made that movie, it was when Deep Throat came out, when all the things came out, Pink Flamingo. So I thought, what's not illegal yet? And that wasn't illegal yet. It is now. Yeah. In the porn world, it's the one thing that's illegal. Wow. We did not do it for sexual reasons, <laughs> although people have come up to Divine of My Life that, hey, that really turned us on. And we run. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to, just to finish this thought about the, the or this conversation about the alt right, um, so do you see this moment like I, to me it's like um, there was a counterculture in the '60s that that you were part of and you were you were making you started to make your movies and then that counterculture was kind of co-opted by the corporate culture and started to be used for advertising. Or you could say we won some things and lost yeah, others. And became more mainstream maybe along the way. And so that when the... No, we got into power. Yes. And so yes. basically all the people that used to want to be called an outsider now are insiders. Right. And that to me is, you know, but, but the, the right wing thing, it is the same in a way. It is a protest and yes. a counterculture of angry people. Yes. Maybe it's funny to them, but it's not crossing over to be no. funny to anybody else, I don't think. Because I don't think it's especially witty. It yeah. can be rude and hideous, but oh, maybe I could search for a few things that were funny, even though I don't agree with it. Right. But we're not funny either now. That's the problem. I mean, I saw at the march of some funny things. You know, uh -huh. I think there will be a porn movie called Comb Over and Blow Me. <laughs> You know, there has to be Trump porn. So. Yes, I'm surprised yeah, it's taken this long. I know. So, I mean, there, and I saw a little kid with a sign that just said, I can't even. A little gay kid. So that was really <laughs> funny. So, there are funny things that protest, yeah, but I don't yeah. understand why people aren't rioting. I don't get why we had that one big march. Well, what are college students? I say when I go to college, are you studying? <laughs> you shouldn't be studying. Johnny, you should be out in the street with right. a pole. Throwing rocks. Yes. Yeah, yeah. My I, I pole. Know. I want my shield. They have shields now. They yes, right. Duct tape. They're very fashionable. Yeah. They're going to be on the runways next year. Yeah, that's true. The, the, arm, the gear. The yeah. gear, yeah. I um, want a shield for fall. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, once an artist makes money in a capitalist society, can they ever truly be subversive? Sure. Um, and I'm not saying, I mean, I always wanted to make money. I was... You know, uh, and all the movies, the early movies, did eventually break even and make some money. You know, um, you have to make some money or else you won't continue. Yeah, that's somebody right. has to like them right. somewhere. The right. more you make movies, and that's why I stopped. The last three movies, nobody came to see. Right. I mean, people liked them some, and they're still playing, but they didn't make money. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You could make a snuff movie. If it made $100 million, you could make five more afterwards right, and nobody right. would say anything. Starring Hitler, by the way. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, that would be too already done. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right. Yeah. But, but um, so it, it's the fact that you do have to make some money to keep going. And, um, and there's a thin line. I always say to young kids when they're making movies, the more money they give you, the more they're going to have to say. It's algebra problem. Yes. You want nobody to tell you what to do? Go make it on your cell phone like I did in the beginning with right. a little 8 mm Same thing. The more you get, when Hollywood treated me fairly, they paid me a lot of money for a while. They had plenty to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess so. <laughs> it was right. their money. Are you, does it ever appeal to you, the thought of like shooting something on the cell phone or doing? No. No, not at all. I'm not going back. Right? Yeah. I'm, to yeah. be 70, I'm 71 now. When this comes out, I don't know, I'll probably be 72. Right. And to be a faux underground filmmaker at 72. And people say, why don't you use Kickstarter? Oh, I own three homes. <laughs> Seems like it'd be kind of hypocritical. Right, yes. Could you help me? Could you give me some money? Or, could you work for nothing? I've never, I have 17 yeah. other movies, but forget them. <laughs> Do you have any feelings about social media in general? Because I've met a lot of comedians now who are almost exclusively doing their Oh thing. no, I don't give anything away. I would never tweet. I, I, I hate now the new journalism. They all call me twice a week. Would you talk about your favorite this? No. You pay me to. That's my job to yeah. do that. You know? And that's what they all do. And then as told to, that's not that's like free journalism. I'm talking, <laughs> if I talk it, you get the money? It seems like the other way around. Sure, I'd be paid. So, 
like tweet, I wouldn't have any material left. I have two spoken word shows I have to constantly update. Yeah. Always working on one or two books. If I give it all, I wouldn't have anything. Left. What it's material? True. I have to think of stuff every day. I have to think of <laughs> fucked up shit. It's too much so, work. <laughs> I have to do it and then give it all away. No, I don't. I mean, I'm on computers. Not like I'm, I'm not on Facebook. Anybody that right. I wanted to fuck from years ago, I've stalked their homes. Right, I don't right. Need to find where they yeah. are today. That's I the problem with Facebook, like. the people that yeah. you fucked in the past. Or the or... people that said, you know, I'm like, I don't care what you had for lunch. And, but I know it's a big marketing tool. Plenty of my friends are on it all the time. I work 10 hour days. I don't yeah. have time to go up there. Yeah, that's that. what I was going to ask yeah. you about your, your work day, about your yeah, discipline. Work, and about well, I've the... never been busier in my whole life than I am now. So, and do you have a, a routine, pretty yeah, much? Yeah, Monday to Friday. Oh, do I? To the point of like, like <laughs> right? You talked about the pens me. and the yeah, pads. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I get up every Monday to Friday, six a.m. I get up. I read six newspapers. Have four cups of tea. Look at my emails. And eight o'clock, I write till eleven or twelve. Then I have the meeting with everybody that works for me. And then in the afternoon, we run our business and sell stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to. Right, right. And what's the weekends about for you these a days? Weekends I have off. I, you know. Hang out. Yeah, I go out to dinner with people, I have friends, I travel a lot, I'm on the road really a lot. Yeah, that's true. I live in Provincetown in the summer, so um, yeah. yeah, I do what everybody does. Yeah. You know, I don't work, get up and have to thimp or something, as I would say. <laughs> right. Um, but okay. a lot of times I do my spoken word show on weekends, so I have to work then anyway. Right, right. And you fly, you'll fly into a city, just do it, and then fly right out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like it better if there's two or three in a row. Yeah, that's good. Um, Christmas is 18. <laughs> you do 18 shows yeah. uh, and, and all over the, the country? Yeah, or is sometimes it... in Europe too, but yeah. Uh huh. Oh, wow. Um, so would you say, I, I feel like on a certain level, your movies, uh, uh, besides all the, the, uh, the elements that people are very familiar with, on a certain level, you are talking about class and you're talking about race in a lot of your movies. Um, I'm not talking about race enough, but I'm not black, so I have to be, you know, you have yeah. to... I don't know. Right, right. I think it's better if you are, if you yeah. talk about it. Um, you know, I certainly made Hairspray, which is a movie about race, but it's yes. a white man's version of yes, it. Yes, but it still, it's... Is. That's one one review came out and said that, they were dead right. It's yeah. a white man's view of the racial problem in the 60s. Yeah. But it's what I remember. Right, you know? right. Uh, so, I do make jokes about things that are serious, but I usually make jokes about things I really like. Yeah. I make fun of the art world, but I like the art world. Right, I make right. fun of this, you know. So, um, I think they are saying something. I think the morals of all my movies are the same. Don't judge other people till you know the whole story. And mind your own business. Right. <laughs> two two it. good uh, aphorisms yeah. to live by. Yeah. For sure. Um, all right, hang on one second. You mentioned Russ Myers already. Did we? Uh, we talked about Leslie Van Houten. Uh, can I ask you, what's your relationship history? Um, I have a boyfriend. You, you do? Know. Um, yeah. You I've, seem uh, like you could be a hard person to love. Is that, would that uh, be well, true? Well, you better ask him. He might agree. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've had three other boyfriends in my life. Yeah. I keep it private. Yeah, And yeah. I'm never attracted to somebody that's in show business. I always have somebody that's in a completely different life than mine. Right, right. I don't feel like talking about the business and the right. development deals and stuff. I want to hear other people's stories. Yeah, the other world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, that's yeah. cool. Um, do you think that you're hard to love, though, in that respect? You're set hmm. in your ways? You yeah, I have think your I thing? am in some ways because of, yes, because of set of my ways, and I work a lot, and I travel a lot. But I think I'm working that out. Okay. Yeah. Good. I good. believe in psychiatry too. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I went back to my. I, I had one for a long time when I was younger, and then not a long time, but a couple of years, and then I go back for touch-ups every ten or fifteen. Right. Years. Right. I did for, that for a while until until. But like, just for he a got few sick. times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Hold on one second. All right. Talk about the uh, talk about the Cooker Brothers and Jack Smith and the underground film. And the gay sensibility at that time, if you would, a little bit. The underground cinema, to me, was I knew about from Jonas Mikas. I knew everything. Right. I got the Village Voice in Baltimore. I hate they went out of business. I still right. have a subscription. Yeah. Andrew Saris yeah. was great also. I yeah, I like Jonas more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm Pauline Kael. I like Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Um, Jonas told me about all these people. How would I know in suburban Baltimore who the Kuchar brothers were in Jack Smith? So I read about them and all. And I would run away to New York on the Greyhound bus and go see those movies at the bridge and the filmmakers 
cooperative and all right, that kind right, of stuff. Right. So that was my education. But at the same time, I was going to drive in here and seeing the nudist camp movies and gore movies. And then I was going to the art films. So yes. it was all those at the same time. And also Hollywood movies as well. Less, probably, Less. at the time. Yeah. Did you have any feeling about the the, uh, the the gay directors of the 40s and 50s, the Cirques or the Kukars? Oh, Cirque, yes, but Cirque, I didn't even... Fassbender reinvented him. Right. You know, I didn't really... I knew Imitation Life, but I didn't get into Cirque as much as I am now until after Fassbender talked about him and reinvented him right. and talked right. about him and everything. And I met Fassbender and Cirque together. Wow, wow. What was that like? Can you talk about I that? I to my knees. <laughs> even though that's an insult today. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> right, exactly. You took yeah. a knee. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, I forget what the question We were talking was. about Cirque and uh, yeah. Kukar and oh, whether yeah. that. So, uh, oh, Kukar. That's different than Kuchar. Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, I'm the happy to talk about both. It, the gay thing of it was part of it, but I always say gay is not enough. You know, right, I mean, right. the Kenneth Anger was really important to that. Janae's movies yes, were really, yes. to me, when I think of gay kind of things. But they were threatening gay. They yes. weren't like happy little Lucifer help. Rising. Yeah, you know, it yeah. wasn't. I never went for that. Yeah. I always was for the more militant ones. Yes, you know? right. And, uh, and all those Kuchars were, yeah, they were gay. They had male nudity in it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. The underground was kind of some gay, yeah. yeah. The straight ones were all more experimental films. Right, like the Bruce gay Conner, ones, made, you know, yeah. like Ed M. Schwiller. Right, right. Color, right. Stan Brackage, and all that. Right, kind of stuff, right. Which I didn't like so much now, and now I do. Right, because yeah. they're more like sort of art, really, yeah, yeah, than they yeah. are like narrative filmmaking. Obviously, um, talk about Kenneth Anger a little bit. He's a very interesting character in this. In yeah, this he doesn't sort of like filmmaking. me. Um, I really. Don't think I'm but anyway, I like him. I think he's one of the most powerful yeah. influence. Everybody copied Kenneth Anger's use of ironic pop music. Yes. Me, Scorsese, everybody did. Custom he did it first. He did it first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about, um, so we, we were talking about Pasolini before. Um, what about uh, people like Bunuel or Godard or Mishima? What, I love all of them, but Bunuel I loved, even though I found out later he was a homophobe, which I hated all the really? surrealists were, yeah. Huh. But um, I love Bunuel, he was a huge influence on mine. Um, Godard I love, I loved his last movie in 3D with his dog, it was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great and he's also somebody yeah, that yeah. was yeah. interested in angering, using well, humor. Even so more now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. his films now really piss people off. Yeah, um, yeah. I've always been a huge Godard fan. Yeah, you know, me too. I think he's great. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's really uh, committed to uh, uh, challenging the audience, yeah. making the audience uncomfortable in his own way. And there's humor, again, under the surface of a lot of his movies yeah. that gets lost yeah. because people get angry at the movie. Yeah. And they don't get a I, chance to see it. I mean, and all the feel-bad European directors. I love Bruno Ganz. I like... Right. Uh, there's so many of them I, yeah. I really like, and I still pick them for my art forum column every year. You know, all these feel bad European movies. I'm right. always a fan right, of the feel Isabel bad. Hubert. I mean, she's my middle school. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. Um, what about filmmakers that were inspired by you? What about like a Harmony Corinne or a David Lynch? How do well, you feel? Well, I don't like to say any of them were, and I don't know that they are. I don't think any of the well, ones that I've Well, I don't think I've they would exist that, without you. That's no, what I feel. Well, that's different. Any of the ones that I inspire, I don't like. Um, I don't think I inspired Harmony, who I like very much, yes. or David Lynch, who I like very much. And yes. I was one. I was one of the first people that came out for Eraserhead because it came out right when I was promoting Female Trouble. Right. And David and I are friends a little bit, and Harmony too. Yeah. So um, I think they're both great filmmakers. I don't think I inspired them. Right. Okay. All right. Um, Talk about, you talked about Janae, you talked about, uh, uh, what about writers like that? John Reshi, what about people like that? John they... Reshi, yeah. I like, I have them all. <laughs> um, uh, also, Hubert Selby, Grove Press. Yes, Grove Press, right, Are you right. kidding? That made me read. Yeah. And, uh, shoplifted all those books. Yeah, they, they were great. Out. They even look cool. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Um, So, yes, and I didn't read as a child because we had to read Benjamin Franklin's life story and write a book <laughs> report on it. So it so turned me off to reading that I didn't really start reading until I was a Teenager. What did you? What made you rediscover reading? Do you remember? Because I read about things that they were banned. Right. You know, right. So right. I read. You know, why would I now read he Sexus Plexus and Nexus? <laughs> right. I read them. They're right up there. Yeah. The hardbacks. Henry right. Miller and, and, and also but Ginsburg and Burroughs and yeah. people like well, that. I always also. read Burroughs. I became friends with Burroughs. Yeah. And um, but. Uh, yeah, so I, I always read all that beatnik stuff. That was the first thing I ever wanted to be, was right. a beatnik. I still am a beatnik in yeah. some ways. I yeah. like beatniks. 
but also again fueled to me when you look at uh, Burroughs or you look at uh, uh, Ginsburg, you look at the the main uh, uh, sort of architects of the beat movement. Again, there's a very gay sensibility. They that, were gay, but they weren't gay first. Right, right, right. They weren't just gay. Right, right. You right, know, right. And they scared gay people. Yeah, right. That's what I like. Right. They were not polite. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah. They hung around with straight people too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't get why anybody wants to hang around with people that are exactly like them. You don't get to hear their bad stories. Yeah. <laughs> their worst nights with sex. Yes, right. I want to hear a straight version too. Yeah, or yeah. Not just a bear version. I want to hear a girl <laughs> biker version. I want to hear every kind. Yeah, of, yeah. Know? Well, you're a very curious person. A lot of people I am. are nosy. Just, that's cool. Yes, right. All right, now place Andy Warhol in all this context. He was where does, huge, where you does know? he fit in? A lot. I'm writing. I just wrote a huge chapter about him in my new book. Um, Andy proved that you know, put gays and drugs together for the first time. So smart. <laughs> gays were so square before Andy. Gays and drugs. That was it. Yeah. And bag hags. Uh huh. Something that was always there, but no one's ever said that or talked about it. So yes, that's, that's his great legacy of yeah. films. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, he was a, he was a pioneer filmmaker. He was. Yeah, uh, from sleep to trash to. I'm not going to. Uh, that's my whole new chapter. Okay, in my book. okay, good. I won't. I won't. Uh, <laughs> well, let me ask you this: Do you feel? I mean, we're talking about the '60s and, and the underground filmmaking and and these writers and artists and filmmakers. Um, and, and Susan Sontag wrote that book on. I love camp. to read mean books about Susan Sontag. There's so <laughs> many of them. I love to read them. I have every one of them. So very, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, but do you think there's any room for camp or kitsch today? I never would say those words. That's like an old queen talking about Rita Hayworth in an antique shop in 1968. Right, 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 right. Um, sure there is, but I don't think they're having more fun. Like if I was young today, I'd be a hacker. Right, I'd right. be right in the dark web. Right, right. Doing yeah, so deep. much shit. That's yeah. what I'd be doing. Yeah, and yeah. I, I miss Silk Road. Yeah. <laughs> no, things I was like... never on it. I wish they had <laughs> nude ads on Silk Road. Right. <laughs> That's what I would have wanted. Right. So things like things that, that fueled some of that work, like like words like an old fashioned words like camp or kitsch. That's kind of like a dead trash it's, became it's more it. I buzz. use filth now, which right. is more like filth. punkish. Right. So it all means the same thing. Yeah. It's but still what truly camp was was something that was so bad they didn't know it. Yeah. That's why Showgirls, he says today that he meant that as a comedy. I don't believe him. No. And that's why it's so great. Yes. And, and that's why the best camp are ones that didn't mean to right. be. The oblivious camp. Yeah. 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 Like but a, if you're trying too hard to be it, it was like when Mommy Dearest came out and bombed, then the studios sent drag queens to theaters with co coat hangers and nobody went for it. Because <laughs> it was not, it, it didn't happen organically. Yes. It just was fake. It, it was, was self-conscious. Fake marketing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very yeah. self-conscious, I agree. Um, tell me about the, uh, what you think about the importance of inappropriate humor and, uh, Sick humor, even. Uh, you sick think, humor. Yeah, that's do, what they used to call it. Right. Sick, sick, yeah, sick, sick Lenny I Bruce was a sick those. comic. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that it's, it taps <laughs> into some sort of shadow self, and that's why it plays an important role, and it never goes away on some level? I think it's about anger, and, and the comedy is about anger, and that everybody feels, and they can make fun of their own anger to let it out, and make fun of people what they're a little nervous about or like I try to take people in a world they feel uncomfortable with with me though I think they feel comfortable yeah so I agree I, I don't think it's threatening to them and yeah. so I think that's how I can get away with it you're the perfect guide to that world well, I try to be that's my yeah. job yes you know yeah but sick humor are you kidding that's what I grew up on. yeah you yeah know? we and all Lenny did Bruce, I loved him you know and Steve Allen when he started out and you know all that kind of stuff as funny as an iron lung you know that's why I'd cry maybe I had an iron lung joke in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know for that exact yeah, reason yeah. Uh, today it's still like that it's just Saturday Night Live is that yeah, and yeah. I think they've had yeah. the best season forever recently you right. know, Trump is perfect for that yes you know? but that's why I think some of all that right. stuff is really like the Kelly Ann stuff is really cutting I mean it's yes, really yes. horrific yes you know? yes so, well, such um, great, uh, I, I'm all for that so yeah. I think what is called sick humor now is American humor yeah oh, it's, that's it's interesting totally mainstream it's every show on television has it well, so to go back to the all right for a second, do you think they see all that as being acceptable now, the sick humor, yes. and they want to push it even further and anger? Who's they? Well, I've met a number of alt right yeah. comedians or people that the purport to be comedians. Maybe, but they think they're funny, but they aren't that funny. Yeah, That's the yeah, thing. Yeah. And I'm not saying, I think dreary liberals aren't funny either. Right, I you understand. Know? They're yes. like, oh, You've God. made that clear. Liberals yeah. 
can be the worst fascists of all. Yes. You know, because they think everyone agrees with them. Yes. And I've seen that, you know, and although I guess when all right-wing people are together, they're the same. Yeah, it's true. I'm just never around all right-wing <laughs> right, parties, right. so I don't that know. That might be something to try, actually. Yeah. Um, but I keep looking with the Trump supporters. I think there must be a cute one. They're working class men. I've never seen a cute one. And in my show, I said, if anyone's here, look, I'm open-minded. That is a cute male that's for Trump. Would you stand up at the end proudly? And we'll salute you. Not one person ever has. Wow. That's an so, incredible record. <laughs> it seems to me. And I look in the crowd. Always, I'm trying to find one. Cute it's going to be scary if you do find somebody, isn't well, it, at this we'll point? I applaud him. Yeah. I'm the nerve. Yeah. I would applaud him or her. Yeah, it's be better if it's transgender the other way, you know. Yeah. Can't tell anymore. Right, no, not at all. Um, do you think America has a short memory in terms of, you know, history? Do you think what, that... cultural history? Yes, yes. Uh, do you think that we wind up uh, kind of forgetting things in the past and then dis thinking we discover them now anew? I, I don't, but I think they always say, in film schools they always say, most kids don't remember anything before Star Wars. I never saw a Star Wars. Right, right. So who am yeah. I to give you an answer? Yeah, that. That's true. All right. I never saw a Star Wars movie. <laughs> um, Not that I'm against it. I just don't understand yeah, yeah, science fiction. Yeah, it's the I, one genre I don't get. Well, so I wouldn't know if it was good or bad. Are you, you are you that uh, way across happened? the board on science fiction? Because to me, Star Wars is a certain type of science no, fiction. No, I just don't get it. I, yeah. I, I don't. Did you ever it. see the Philip K. Dick, um, A Scanner Darkly? No. Okay, that I, I would uh, yes because it's in rotoscope. Richard Linklater directed yeah, it. Yeah, I like Richard Linklater. Yeah, and it's a it's a uh, it's in rotoscope, and it's a oh, it's yes, a drug story. I did see it. I did a, see it. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's not the kind of stuff. Um, it's no special effects. It's All like, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, your grandmother bought you your first camera. Is that right? Yeah. Tell me about that. It was just an eight millimeter regular camera. Did I you asked ask for, for it? it? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. And uh, and she gave it to me, and then I made hanging a black leather jacket on it. But I didn't know there was editing. I was dogma. I just filmed it, and that was a movie. <laughs> I filmed it in order of the shots yes. I bought. I didn't know that anything about it. I yeah. had no idea how a film was made or anything. Was it? When you and you can tell when you look at it. That's why I played once. <laughs> when you discovered editing, was that like a kind of an epiphany and a Well, you should always, I tell all kids now, if you think you should gut it, cut it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I look at Mondor Trasho and it's 90 minutes, it should be 30. <laughs> and at the end, I would cut, my movies would all be 10 minutes long if they didn't get me out of right. editing room. <laughs> but did you, did cut you it, want, cut it. But I would it. imagine, I'm guessing, but I would imagine you wanted your movies to be full length movies also. Always I did. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I know, shorts, I know. You know. Right, Even right. when I'm at the movies now and shorts come on, I think, <laughs> even though sometimes they're good. Your uh, anti-cigarette smoking ad that used to short, appear yeah. before him. Yeah, those were great. Those that were great. was done for the Landmark Theater chain to, not for the cigarette ad. I was doing a thing thanking the audiences for playing Pink Flamingos for 10 years at midnight. And then they had, the Martin Twins made that movie at the time, Doug and Steve Martin. And they had just extra film. They said, do anything. I just did one take. It was just off the top of my head. Really? And wow. it was, you know. And it was no copyright, so we said play it, and it got playing everywhere. It still plays sometimes. I, I go in a theater and it comes on, and I think, oh my God. You know, because it was probably 40 years ago or something. Right, and when did you quit smoking? Uh, I have my card, it's like 5,800. I write it down every day, like 5,892 days. Are you still ago. struggling? No. Uh huh. Although, you never know. Well, I've if quit I smoked one, I'd shove a card and it cools up my ass. Uh, yeah, that's how I feel too. I've, yeah. I've quit a couple of times. <laughs> You know, and I found that the the desire, it's not all the time, but once in a while, no, it sort of I see people up. now smoking. I think, oh, thank God. I yeah, it was so hard that. to quit. Also, oh, you were a big smoker too. A five packs a day. Five yeah. packs a day. And now I what see was your brand? kids cool. Thank the packs even look different now. Thank God. But I see kids now that have to be the stupid. I didn't know when I was young that cigarettes were bad for. They didn't. My mother gave me cigarettes. Right. You know, I doctors used to, used to yeah, advertise yeah, them. Yeah. yeah, But now they know. And yeah. so finally, kids stopped smoking Marlboros. They thought up a new brand, Marlboro Black, and it worked. <laughs> I thought, how stupid are you? The only thing I think kids are stupid about right. is cigarettes. It's wow. the only thing the government ever told us. Through the only thing I regret. Wow, that's in very, life. very interesting. That's cool. Um, so, so you were you were given this camera, and you started to make movies, and this is something you had wanted to do. And 
But if you weren't a filmmaker, what do you think you would have been? I always say the question, I would have been Judith Clark. I would have been a uh, criminal defense right, lawyer. Right, right. I was going to guess maybe mass murder, but you're saying somebody no, would I cover the mass murder. murder. I wasn't yeah. violent. Right, ever. right, of course. I just had an outlet for it. But do you think it would be a good idea? The reason I bring it up is because do you think it would be a good idea to give more high school kids, because that's a time when kids are kind of going through this big transition, to give more kids cameras and things like that, to let them express themselves in other ways and have these outlets. I guess. I mean, you know, I don't know. I can't come in and say that I can fix the educational system of Baltimore, believe me. Right, um, right. You know, certainly it's so much cheaper now, the digital film and everything. Yeah. It's not like you have to go and develop it's it. It's true. They already have their phone. Yeah, they don't right. really need so a camera. They can do it. Why did the school have to do it? They all have phones. Yeah, They can do right. it themselves. Yeah. Yeah, they just don't. But maybe, but, for, but a lot of people do. That's yeah, why a there's lot so of people many bad do. movies. That's right, and even bad two-minute videos, yeah. for that matter. Um, let's talk about fake news, because would you say that the, where would you say fake news began? Well, I would never say that word because I don't believe. Right. The term. Okay. Is, well, yeah. I was thinking more about like when JFK was murdered, and then the conspiracy theories oh, began. Oh, the conspiracy theories are so boring. I think Oswald acted alone. Right, but I'm but I'm not even. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. more curious about the idea that like the Inquirer would show. Well, Kennedy I get alive. the Inquirer in the mail. I've gotten it forever. Yeah. And uh, I used to like it. I hate it now huh. because of the whole Trump thing. They just are pro Trump, but it's like it's not funny anymore. Right, the, the Inquirer right. used to be funny. Yeah. I mean, there's, sometimes it's so mean, it's funny, the headlines, who will die next? It has people's <laughs> pictures. Yeah. You think, how would you just, if you're in the supermarket, yeah. you say, you oh, see yourself. and they have, you're next. Uh, so I still read them. I get the, here's the three of them. The Star, which really has fake stuff in it. So basically, it's the Inquirer, we hate you because you're famous. The Star, we hate you because you're on television. The Globe, we hate you because you're famous and you have sex. That's the editorial policy. <laughs> I see. But the Inquirer, I used to like. They didn't come after me. And what am I hiding? Really? Right. You know? Right. Exactly. But now it's not funny anymore. It's, right. Their their things aren't funny, and it's the same shit they put in the Globe. They because I get them both, and they use the same pictures and right. the same just, story. They got lazy. So to me, no, I did like that. There, the big article was in the New Yorker recently, but the editor he said we show stars failing because our readers are failing. I love wow, that wow. editorial policy. A well, political, that's, a that political is statement. a smart statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah very interesting. Yeah. Um, talk about some of the, um, the the cast of those early movies. Tell me about. I'm still uh, friendly with them. The ones that are alive. Mink and I, Mink Stoll and I, are still great friends. Right. Um, Mary Vivian Pierce, great friend. She lives in Nicaragua. Had you been friends with them before you started making the movies? Yes. Uh huh. And what about like someone like Edith Massey? No, we met her in Fells Point, where she worked in that real bar that's in Local right. Maniacs, right. and uh, Vincent Perenio and Sue Lowe. Vince did all the sets for my movies, and Sue was in yeah. them. They introduced me to her, and she was working there, and we filmed her playing herself in Multiple Maniacs, and then she just kept going with us. Wow, that's great. Um, what it's did amazing. You I just came back from Spain, where I went to this trash festival, and there was like five thousand people over the weekend. 20 year olds that can't even speak English, really, it's not their language in Malanga, Malaga, Spain, dressed as Ida. Wow. It was so bizarre. That is weird. You know? but, but great. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. Um, I'm curious though, like when you went to Edith or you went to Mink Stola or some of your friends, David Lockery, these people, what was your pitch to them? Well, they were, David always wanted to be a movie star and thought he was one. And <laughs> Mink was sophisticated enough to know it. Edith was a different story. Edith was an outsider actress. Yes. I think would be the best way yes. to do it. Yes. And she didn't know anything about underground movies or anything. She didn't know the movie. Everybody else did, you know, because we went to see them all the yeah, time. And yeah, stuff. Yeah. So I think Edith was more the one from the outside. But she treated it very seriously. She would spend a lot of time memorizing her lines. And she was... Uh, and fans loved her. I yeah, mean, she really yeah. had a following, definitely, yeah. right up well, to the Well, there was end. something, like you say, she was an outsider actress, but there was something so authentic yeah, yeah. because of that. Even Warhol, when he met her, where did you find her? <laughs> you know, which was, yeah, she was a good one. She was irreplaceable, certainly. Um, I know, so, so then, then <laughs> as you, you started to get more successful, and started to, you started to move towards um, using uh, people who had been involved in uh, Criminal activity, like well, the first outside was desperate living with uh, Liz, Liz Renee. Renee yeah, yes, yeah, Liz tell Renee. us about her a little bit. 
Well, she was Mickey Cohen's girlfriend, and I read her book called My Face for the World to See. And so she was a stripper, and she ran nude up Hollywood Boulevard for five blocks when she was in her 50s. So I went to meet her at first at the Combat Zone in Boston, and then I think I met her at the Ivar Theater, and, right. which was right across the street from the Old Brown Derby, or right near there. <laughs> yeah. She was great. I just always loved her. Yeah, Liz yeah. Renee. She was an exploitation queen. She was great. So yeah, Edie Williams. That's Edie Williams right over there, I think. No, it? that's that's um, uh, what's her name, Fellini. Um, oh, oh, oh uh, uh, yes, Anita Ekberg. Anita Ekberg. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and so, uh, and how about Patty Hearst? How did you how did you connect? Well, with I her? was obsessed by that trial, but I didn't know her. And then she said later, "That's people like you is why I got arrested." Um, and uh, and I met her in Cannes when she was uh, promoting the Patty Hearst movie that she did, Paul Schrader, Paul when she bought her movie. book. And yeah. people seated me next to her at dinner, and we got along. And then I asked her, come in, and she thought I was kidding to try out. And then she did, and then I kept putting her in movies because she was funny. She yeah, was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and she, good. then people couldn't use that shit against her. Same reason Johnny Depp, Patty Hearst, Tracy Lord, they all came with me and make fun of the image you're trying to get rid of, and yeah. they can't do it anymore. Right. Right. And Patty said, I never signed an autograph. For what? For being kidnapped? <laughs> yeah. Until she made the movie. Yeah. And then, yeah, fine. Yeah. And Tracy won't sign porn, but, right. you know, she went on and she's doing great. Yeah. So, you sort of, like, gave them a new path in life, in <laughs> You just sense. make, no, you just make fun of the image you're trying to get rid of with me, who said I made trash. I did that from the beginning, too. Right, I right, was right. trying to get a bad reputation, <laughs> and they were trying to get rid of one. Right. That's very interesting. That yeah. cross-section, right? Yeah. That intersection. Um... Okay, hold on. Let's let's talk about. You've made a lot of movies. I don't know exactly yeah. how many, um, yeah, but, I but um, you also I know have a lot of movies that haven't gotten made. Not uh, that many. Not really. that many. Tell me about a couple of the pet projects. The only ones that, that haven't gotten made was something called Glamour Puss, which was about a woman on location that falls in love with the guy that takes the sewage out of her trailer. <laughs> And then another one was called Fruitcake, which was a children's Christmas right, movie that right. I still might get made. Flamingos Forever, that never came out, but it came out as a book. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, you, so you, many. you have actually yeah. produced almost and everything that you've written. I got paid development deals from Paramount for Glamour Puss. Right. Uh, Fruitcake, I got a development deal, too. The only mm -hmm. one I didn't is uh, Flamingos Forever, but yeah. I got a book deal. Yeah, yeah, that so worked So they out. all... You know, so you don't have you don't have uh, uh, that sort of thing of uh, the things that didn't get made. No. Yeah. No. Like Orson Welles has no, no, had. No. I would have yeah. exploited them in some way. I right. Used right. up the idea. What do you but, think about somebody like Orson Welles? I mean, I didn't think about even talking about him, but he's an interesting figure in all of this. Also, kind of an underground filmmaker of his day. Well, didn't he, he make the most Butterfly popular? at the end with Pia Zadora? He did, yes, and also yes. with Ed McMahon. And <laughs> what kind of movie has Ed McMahon and Orson Welles together at last on the screen? <laughs> People were that's clamoring what, for that's it. That's how I remember Orson <laughs> yes, Welles. Yes, It's from Butterfly. Right, right. Have you ever seen any pieces of Other Side of the Wind with no. uh, John Huston? Uh -uh. Also pretty interesting, kind yeah. of at the time. Uh, it's on. There's pieces of it on YouTube, actually. Never got finished. He's he's the oh, king. Oh, he started never got made. He's yeah. the king of the unfinished yeah, yeah, yeah. projects. So, but that's not you. See, I was curious whether you had like a stack no. of stuff that you wanted to get made. Not at all. That's very interesting. Um, all right. So, was there a script for Pink Flamingos? Like, how yeah. elaborate a script was it? A it complete was a script. script. It was handwritten. You know, did I write it as I went along? Maybe a little, but I always knew what was going to happen. I knew the end. I knew right. it took place in the trailer. It was the two locations, the right. Marbles House and that. And yeah, there was a script. Yeah. Was it completely written before we started? Maybe not, because we only filmed on weekends, and sometimes it'd be two or three weeks till I get the money to do the next part, yeah. or you know. So uh, yeah, there was a script though. Nothing was ad libbed in that movie. And what were you doing to get, get the money for it at that time? I was on unemployment. I ran a bookshop in Provincetown every summer, and it closed in the winter, so I got unemployment. Wow. Um, it's I'm so, sure it's so perfect. I was on aid to the totally disabled. Everybody was on welfare, unemployment, or sole pot. And were they pitching in uh, financially? No. For the, you, you did that I, all my yourself. My father lent me the money. Your father lent you the money. And I paid him all back with interest. Right. And he was mad I paid him back, because then he, he knew I'd ask him again. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and finally, and he was so shocked that he got the money back. Wow, yeah. And he never saw it. That's the most shocking thing you might have ever done, is pay your yeah. father back and on that initial loan. and then finally I said, can I have the money, can I borrow some to make 
No, that was, um, yeah. And then he said, okay, but you don't have to pay me back for Pink Flamingos. Just put it all in your next one. That's your college education. You didn't go, but don't ask me anymore, which was really fair. Yeah. You know, and taught me capitalism and how it works. And, yeah. and you know, I wanted to pay him back. That was the ultimate way I could say, see? Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. That was, your, that was the sign of success. Yeah. Um, But no, they didn't. I didn't go raise money from the gas. Right, right. Have to like no, pitch you. In. Yes, I understand. Um, now we had talked about Carsick uh, and tr tried for a while to right. try to get it made as a movie. Um, but you, this is based on an ex incredible experience that you had. Well, the Carsick, the book was three parts. The first two were me imagining fiction, the yes. worst that could happen and the best. And if you didn't read the introduction, people would say, oh, that couldn't be true. Yeah. Well, read the introduction. <laughs> yeah, it's so simple. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, right. So, um, it's and then I did it for chapters, real. And then yeah. I hitchhiked for real. And I just, yeah. in May of this year, just drove across the country again. It was so easy after a hitchhiking. It was yeah. nothing. I just wake up and read, <laughs> big deal. You know, I have a car I can get in. So, uh, yeah, I don't regret it. I'm still friendly with some of the people yeah. that I met. I was in the Quebec Kids' wedding last year. Right, right, uh, right. I'm, the Kansas couple has come to visit me. Yes, I'm, I, I'm fr still Mainly friends. Mainly the with Republican the guy. He was the Corvette Kid. The yeah. Corvette Kid, right, yeah. right, right. He right. didn't run again. Right. Oh, <laughs> you may have ruined his reputation. I don't know. <laughs> um, did you when you first the, like the first day and I and I've read the book and yeah. I remember you even talking about it and I saw a video I guess the kids the kids in the band who oh, that picked was, you yeah, up that, that was in the Miller country yeah but that first day uh, uh, talk about that first day of hitchhiking half a block from here and yeah it started raining yeah right when I walked out there and I stood there for two hours no one picked me up because I went at six in the morning no one's leaving there was no cars wow. I live in a residential neighborhood, you know, there wasn't right. like, there was no drugs. So I just stood there and then it started raining and I just, yeah. I couldn't come home. It would be too embarrassing right. to come back in after my whole staff who thought I was insane to do this and yeah. was violently against it. Would have just said, you know, been <laughs> merciless. Did you did you have any fear at all during no, those I early? No, I I had fear. No one was going to pick me up. Right, right. That was I would have gotten in with Bundy in a Volkswagen and a sling. I would have hopped in. <laughs> um... What do you find funny these days? What do you? Uh, I find things funny. Um, I'm reading this book <laughs> about Princess Margaret that came out that I was lap tears were coming out wow. of my eyes. It was so funny. <laughs> um, that's the last thing that made me really laugh. What do you think about the Hollywood scandals, the sexual harassment, sexual assault scandals? Well, I don't think they're scandals? funny. Right, right. You know, I think right, right. No, of course. I, I mean, never met her. I, Harvey owns one of my art pieces that we were going to, really? we were going to, he was going to lend to my big museum show I'm having this year. Oh, I guess that's, you know, how <laughs> we're going to find it. Um, but I never pitched him or anything. You know, right, I didn't know him. Right. Um, I didn't really know any of the people yet that have been accused Right, right. So, thankfully. Yeah, makes it a little easier, certainly. Yeah. Um, did you work for them? I did a movie for Bob Weinstein last mm -hmm. year and had a terrible experience. Actually. With him, yeah, he's yeah. getting bad press now. Too. Yeah, he's, he, was a, he was quite an asshole to me. The last time we met, I reached out to shake his hand, and as I shook his hand, he said, this is the last time we'll ever shake hands. Who said that, you or him? Bob said that uh -huh. to me, and I laughed. Because I thought he was joking, but he wasn't joking. And he recut my movie and ruined it. Oh. Um, but, you know. Um, well, no, that never happened to me. Right, I know. I mean, yeah. I had to go through How test did you screenings. Avoid that? And, oh, I've been a negotiation. You know, I had to go through, believe me, it, it almost happened many times. Yeah. And they'd say, you'll never work in this town again. I said, I don't care. I don't live here. Yeah. If I do what you say, I'll never work again either. Well, did you always own... No, I don't know. From Hairspray on, I didn't own any of them. Right, so right. I had test screenings, I had notes, I did the whole thing. They were fair in the long run. I put out the movie I wanted to put out. It was not easy getting there always. Yeah. They paid me a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Which I look back, I'm shocked at how much they paid me for a few of them. Right, right. So, right. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, I remember... You know, LA is really, when things are going well, very seductive, when they're going terribly, it's the worst place in the world. Yeah, At least that's, that's how I feel. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, actually. Um, Larry, I'd like to start a new clip, just one second. Yeah, okay, hang on. Do you want some water or something? Uh, no, okay, I'll back up. Could I have water? Yeah. yeah, I'll have a water. You got an extra one there? This is, here, this is you. Okay, thanks. Great, man.
Sure. Thank right. you. Let me just make sure I'm not skipping over anything. So that's the thing I must say off the record, but everybody, no one's sorry this happened to Harvey or anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought Quentin was actually brave. Yeah. He's the only one that wasn't a hypocrite that said, I did know some of them. I didn't yeah. do anything. Yeah. I thought in a way that was kind of brave. No it one him, said that. It took that. him a couple Not of days. Other. I know, but still. I'm sure he had to figure it out. I mean, it must if, have been who shocking. Knows if, if he had greenlit every movie I ever made, I don't know. Right, you feel some loyalty be, it's so to him. It's hard to get anybody to say yeah. Yeah, I yeah, and you feel some loyalty. You know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I could, you know, somebody who's willing to sponsor to be a patron of the arts, who turns out to be Caligula. Yeah. You know, it's like there is a that is a dichotomy that you have to often deal with when you're an artist. See, I always knew he was horrible to film because I hadn't heard that about the women. Yeah, yeah. No, neither had I. But you know? I heard more about the filmmakers. About they all hated him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the filmmakers hated him. He cut everything, changed yeah. everything, and got success, and which of course fueled his exactly. you know, the craziness. Um, you guys already you good, Ken? Okay. Um, let me see where I'm at. Okay, so I only have a few more questions. Um, I was going to ask you when the last time you cried. Probably when somebody died, you know, or sometimes thinking about my both my parents who died, you yeah. know, like not in a way that I'm like, you know, but when you maybe don't expect it. Yeah, I yeah. I would say that would be. How long? How but long? Unfortunately, has it been? a lot of people I know, I'm 71. People yeah. are starting to die. Yeah, yeah. For normal reasons, it used to be my whole life people been in the arts, AIDS, suicide, yeah, drug yeah. overdose, premature, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now it's ones that are, you know, just dying of things, nature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so that brings me to the, my final question, really. How do you feel about aging and death? Well, that's the last chapter of my book. Okay. <laughs> how, how do, that's the next. I haven't started yet. I got the notes. That's, okay. I've, I've written seventeen chapters. That's seventeen. I'm on sixteen. You could try so, something without ours here. <laughs> no. How do I feel? I've had a great life. Are you kidding? This is all gravy. Every dream I had came through years ago. This is way more than I ever expected. And people want to puke when they hear you saying that. <laughs> but it's true. That's great. This is all gravy. If I, I died tomorrow, more good happened than I ever thought would happen in my life. And no fear. I never had to get a real job. Right. I did what I wanted to do for the, always my whole life, right. pretty much. And someone always liked it enough that I could yeah. keep, keep doing it. That's true. Do That's I true. fear? Sure. You know, you fear like, uh, you know, I hate, I don't want people to remember me. And even my parents, when they died at the end, my parents lived to be 91. They had a mm -hmm. good life. But those last year, you know, when they're really ill and it takes a long time to die, I don't want to, you know, I think I'll like, Maybe see you before that. Not commit suicide. I mean, like, not see people. I don't want people gathered around right, my right, right. for my last gasp, and that's how they. You don't want to see me. people. You don't want to be photographed in a wheelchair no, going out to a no, you know, to your car. You know, no, yeah, no. those horrible pictures so, of people. Um, uh, you know, I hope I get to die in my own house. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That would be nice. This yeah. would be a great place to die. I'm, yeah. Can I come here and die also? <laughs> this is a nice place to floor die. I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, good. All right, this is great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank really you. appreciate Thank it. You. It was great to meet you in person finally. Right. Let's make a movie. Let's make a movie now. Let's do it. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Tone, He's yep. got a good okay, tone. So, 20 seconds of room tone starting now. You can have stomach growling in it. Let me take your picture. I take everybody's picture all together. Okay, one picture. Great, great. And then I'll give you a tour of the house. All right, we want to all get a picture with you as well. All right. Just two uh, of us? Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course. Thank you. Now that's a good looking couple. Look at that. All right, Frank. One, two, and three. One, two, and. That's can I take one. a look? Can I take okay, a look? Okay, no, thank you. Yep. Yes, of course. How long have you owned this place? 1990. 1990. Where'd you live before then? Um, I, uh, 
in kind of a ghetto neighborhood, but I had a great apartment. Oh. Yeah, for 17 years, I lived in that one. Excellent. Right. Then I lived in the house, the Pink Flamingos, and oh, then yeah. I lived in an apartment. I only had four places. Can I, can I take, can, can I do one more sure. with my camera? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Thank you. Doesn't he remind you of Ed a little bit? Yeah. John has a friend named Ed, and when you walked yeah, yeah. up, I was like, whoa, you gotta look like him. He's taller. Yeah, he's tall. Right. One, two, yeah. and three. One, two, and that's it. All right. Cool. All right. Great. Great. Yes, take us around. All right, you want to do the tour first? Yes. All right. So that mirror, that's an art piece. It's not a dirty mirror. Really? But it's a painting. That whole thing is painted on. Like wow. I, no, don't touch it. I'm not going to touch it. But if you ran your hand in it, it oh, wouldn't, it wouldn't it, uh, make it in the dust. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. That's very cool. And that's the Unabomber birdhouse. I, love that one. So, I was actually admiring your Pentagon ash, your 9-11 well, Pentagon ashtray. That's all. Ashtray. They have millions of them. That's the buildings of destruction. You've yes. never seen them? No. It's every, the Unabomber. Does that have oh, all of the houses? Wow. This is the, where Hurricane was. Um, so they, somebody, there's somebody, 20 of them. Really? Yeah, they, it's like oh, a collection. Yeah, it's called Buildings of Disaster. Oh. I have them all over the house. Which this one is? Which one is this one? Lorraine Motel. Okay, the Martin Luther King shoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so incredible. Are we filming this tour? I, no, I'll, we'll right. only film what you what you think is okay. And I don't Let's know if we'll even bother. Do it and then tell me what you want to shoot. All right, okay. All right. That's. Do I have it? On? You do have it on, but. John, yeah. Is it okay if I pan your closet? Let me with see your what clothes. You look like I'm bragging about clothes. Though. Well, you you're a very flamboyant and very distinctive dresser. It's almost like yeah, Superman. No, I'll get, I'll get it's like okay. opening Superman's closet. You know, do a pan, go wide, get the uh, get the sign on top. Okay. All right, folks, I'm fiddling with the macro here. <laughs> 